Um, this is new work, what I am going to present today. So I especially am looking forward to your comments and criticisms and input. Uh, there is a handout of translated text uh, to help you just to follow the argument. I do not intend to do any closed textual work today or tomorrow come to that. Uh, and this is why the texts are uh, just in translated form. Um, there are, my paper is um, uh, consists in three parts. They are unequal. Uh, the first one concerning Epicurus is much longer than the rest. And I shall certainly try to keep within the time of 50 minutes at most. Uh, so uh, the surviving writings of Epicurus and his followers contain several references to Epibole, a notion of historical and philosophical interest that does not receive discussion in the extant Epicurean text even though it is known to have been debated within the garden. The grammatical components of epibole, epibalein, have commonly been taken to indicate that the term refers to mental projection or attention. The same holds for the Latin variants of epibole, that is expressions such as animi in iectus in Lucretius book two, animi iactus in Lucretius book two again, and then in Cicero de natura deorum, se, uh, se for the mind, iniciens et ittendens. There is no consensus, however, about what epibole is, what it is of, and what it operates on nor does the scarce secondary literature on epibole establish whether or not epibole is a distinct mental act. The epistemological status and role of that notion are also unclear. On the one hand, Epicurus explicitly states that the criteria of truth are three, namely sensations, preconceptions, and feelings, and overt disagreement with the founder's position, as we know, was not tolerated within the Epicurean school. On the other hand, Diogenes Lurtius attests that some Epicureans added the fantasticae epibolae to the anoias, representational epibolae of the mind, to the canonical list. This issue is crucial because the criteria of truth are supposed to provide both access to truth and a solid basis for action. The aim of this paper is to propose a new interpretation of Epibole. While I shall refer in passing to Epicurus' theory of perception, I shall not speculate on the physiological mechanisms bearing on Epibole. Others have done that, David Constant, most notably, Francesca Massi, Pierre-Marie Morel. I shall not be dealing myself with physiology, but only occasionally and little. Rather, following the lead of the ancient sources, I should be mainly concerned with its epistemological and ethical import. In part one of the paper, I examine Epicurus's references to Epibole in the letter to Herodotus uh, and a little bit in the principal doctrine, there is one of them that refers to it, and I should try to piece together his own conception of it. In part two, I revisit the unanimously endorsed consumptions that epibole is mental projection and or is identical with attention. Um, and uh, I do intend to um, try to qualify these assumptions, if not reject them. And in part three, I discuss the reception of Epicurus's twofold notion of epibole by the Epicureans of the late Hellenistic and early Roman era and in particular, Lucretius and Philodemus. Uh, and in the end, I shall make, uh, I shall present a very brief summary of what my argument was about. Part one, at the outset, I wish to say something about the syntax and semantics of Epibalein and Epibole and point to a possible ambiguity in the Epicurean expression, Epibole is the annoyers standardly rendered, as I said, as mental projection and interpreted as an act in which the mind projects itself either upon something external to the perceiver or alternatively, that I believe is conscience interpretation upon basic concepts derived from experience and stored in memory. And these are the preconceptions. As indicated, the literal meaning of epibalein and its cognates is 
to throw forward, to thrust forward, to cast upon. But the verb can also mean to lay on, to apply, to affix. And metaphorically, sometimes it is uh, used in the sense of attention. By extension, it can be used in the senses of laying something upon something else with or without exercising pressure. This is Galen's use of the term. Fastening one thing onto another, this is Thucydides' use of the term, and even, and this is in philosophical text now, forming an intuition, forming a notion, and even cognition. These uses arguably fall within the same semantic neighborhood and perceive the core meaning of something being imposed from above upon something else. But connotations of epibalene differ from one context to another, and the same holds, of course, for the cognate noun. Typically, these terms are what we might call success terms. In referring to the corresponding activities, they also connote the anticipation of successful results. If so, then epibole can refer to either the performance or the outcome of epibole. This remark is relevant to our understanding of the phrase epibole is de anoias, where, as mentioned, the genitive dianoias has always been assumed to be a subjective genitive, and the expression has always been taken to mean that it is the mind that is doing the projection. However, um, and that is as far as I want to go for now, there is no grammatical or syntactical or semantical obstacle to either to the, to the suggestion that something else is being actually projected upon the mind. Um, and that would mean, of course, taking the genitive dianoias to be a genitive of, of possession. Uh, I want to remember this ambiguity. I, we need to remember this ambiguity as we engage with the evidence from Epicurus. In the opening lines of the letter to Herodotus, while Epicurus addresses his targeted audience, he makes the following remark. And this is text one, T1 in your handout. Those who have sufficiently advanced in the comprehensive survey of the entire system ought to fix in their memory the outline of the whole treatise, organized as it is under the headings of its principal elements, for we frequently are in need of a comprehensive grasp of the whole, a troa epibole, whereas we seldom need to have a grasp of the details, catameros epibole. Right from the beginning, then, Epicurus draws a distinction between two kinds of epibole, one general and comprehensive, the other specific and partial. The former consists in the memorization of the stoichia, that is, the basic elements of Epicurean atomism. The latter has to do with the apprehension of particular details. More advanced students are expected to master the general outline of the system by memorizing and regularly rehearsing its key points, the kiriotata. As for its details, we are told that they can be grasped through epibolae that do not presuppose a holistic understanding of the doctrine. In the immediate sequel of the text, this is T2, which I won't read, Epicurus suggests that the rehearsal and memorization of the cornerstones of the Epicurean doctrine are necessary for the comprehensive epibole of the whole system. If we comprehend the cardinal principles and store them in memory, this means that we have acquired a synoptic grasp of physics. And if we possess that kind of grasp, we also become increasingly abler to understand points of detail. The relation between the two types of epibolae is therefore reciprocal and dynamic. Some epibolae of specific details seem to be necessary, though not sufficient, in order to acquire a comprehensive overview of the whole. And also, we can acquire a bivoli of parts of the system by virtue of and alongside with our comprehensive view of the system as a whole. From this point onwards, and until he reaches almost the end of the letter, Epicurus will be principally concerned with catameros epibolae. And he explicitly is going to raise the question, 
how we ought to use them. In response, he claims that we can make appropriate use of them only if we heed the connection between our epiboli, the elements that they are supposed to represent, and the words that express them. We should refer synagomenon, each of our epiboli, to both the corresponding element and the correlated word. No further clarification is given regarding the relation between these three items, epiboli, stichiomata, and phonai. Nonetheless, Epicurus's suggestion looks curiously parallel to the methodological advice that he offers to Herodotus in text three of your handout. And I am quoting the second part of the passage, quote, furthermore, we should attend in every way to our sensations and generally to the present epiboli, tas parousas epibolas, whether of the mind or of any one of the criteria, so that we may have the means of drawing side inferences about not yet confirmed or non-evident things." End quote. Epicurus specifies here that first and foremost, we should attend Terrain is the verb he uses. You should attend to our sensations and generally our present epiboli of the mind or of any one of the criteria and quote, so as to have a means of determining what awaits confirmation and what is a non-evident thing. Assuming, as many have done, that the epiboli of the mind are associated with the primary concepts or preconceptions while the epiboli of the other criteria are associated with sensations or perceptions with a species and pathy, Epicurus suggests, in my view, that each application of the criteria necessarily involves an epibole. What exactly might be the contribution of the latter? It enables us, according to Epicurus, to distinguish between things that admit of verification or falsification and others that don't. It seems, therefore, that epibole is necessary for the function of the criterion and jointly responsible for that function. How so? Epicurus's Epicurus remark that we should observe the epibole that we are having at present, the paruse epibole, points to the directness and immediacy of these events. We have the capacity to perceive, to conceive, and to feel. And every time that we exercise one of these capacities, a directly and self-evidently cognizable content becomes available to the mind. This, I suggest, is the nature of a bibole. A few additional remarks are in order. First, it is clear that the epiboli connected with standard uses of the criteria are catameros, specific and of narrow scope. Second, insofar as its occurrence is inextricably connected to the application of the criteria, each epibole is natural in the Epicurean sense of what it is for something to be fifty, as it is specified by Demetrius Laco. It means that it is necessary and it is unavoidable. And typically, it is also effortless. We don't try to gain epibola, we simply get them. On the other hand, attending terrain, uh, to use Epicurus's word, to the present epibola of the mind and the other criteria, as Epicurus urges us to do in Herodotus 38, presumably requires intellectual effort. And I'll say much more about this below. Finally, because of their intrinsic connection to the criteria, epiboli point outwards, not inwards. The mind does not focus on its own processes, but on content revealing truths about the world. Epiboli and its cognates reappears in Epicurus's account of perception and thinking. The thesis that perceiving and thinking presuppose actual contact with simulacra or films of atoms coming from the surface of the objects serves as the basis for Epicurus's thesis, controversial thesis, that all sense impressions are true. 
In this context, epibolae are contrasted with the movement of the soul distinct from them and responsible for falsehood. Look please at text four. Quote, and whatever fantasia representation we receive by way of epibole, epibility costs ad advert here through the mind or the senses, whether it is a representation of shape or of some other property, this shape is the shape of a solid thing. On the other hand, falsehood and error always dwell in the additional element of opinion about that which awaits to be confirmed or remain uncontested, but then receives no confirmation or is contested. Uh, I am skipping the scholium here and go several lines down. Error wouldn't have occurred if we hadn't experienced also some other movement in ourselves conjoined with the representational epibole, but distinct from it. In relation to this movement, if it isn't attested or is contested, falsehood arises. Whereas if it is attested or not contested, truth is established, end quote. This excerpt is suggestive of the idea that epibole, and of course we keep talking about catameros epibole here, may be a manner of cognition rather than a distinct cognitive act. Epicurus says that we receive fantasia, representations of the mind or the senses, epibility costs by way of epibole. The adverb seems to point to a mode of operation related to the mind's capacity of apprehending certain types of contents and making them directly available to consciousness. It is crucial to remember that these are formed on the basis of something real namely streams of atoms deriving from solid objects. A colored triangle received a biblity course is directly apprehended by the mind exactly as it is given to perception. But whether the content apprehended in that manner is truthful only of simulacra or also of their external source, that is going to be decided by doxa opinion, not by epibole. The next passage under examination supports the hypothesis that epibole is a matter of how a property is singled out and apprehended by the mind. Also, if we assume that catameros epibole involves some sort of projection, this passage prompts us to raise questions about the nature of that projection as well as its direction. The context is this. After completing his sketchy defense of the corporeality of the soul, Epicurus turns to our conception of body and its attributes. He argues that the permanent properties of body are known by sensation and can't be conceived independently of themselves. However, we conceive of body by considering it as a whole and not merely as the sum of its permanent properties. Look please at text five. Quote, all of these properties, I claim, merely give the body its own permanent nature. They all have their own epibolae and distinguishing features, the ellipses, but always along with body as a whole and never in separation from it. And it is in accordance to this complex, complete conception of body as a whole, katatina proan enoyan, that it is designated as such, end quote. The properties mentioned above are shape, magnitude, weight, and color. Epicurus claims that each of these properties has its own epibolae chi the ellipses, and the natural reading of this phrase is that it refers to the characteristic manner in which each property is perceived and distinguished. We can appreciate once more the robust epistemic tie between epibole and the criteria. Knowing a property by way of epibole and knowing it, quote, according to sensation, end quote, amount to almost or perhaps even exactly the same thing. 
while interpreters unanimously assume that epiboli is the projection of the mind on some sort of object, this particular text appears to suggest a different sort of projection, not of the mind, but on the mind, while the mind is perceiving, is, is grasping, is apprehending mind. The same idea can be detected in another quite obscure passage of the letter to Herodotus, this is 7071, on body and its properties. Bodies, we are told, have accidental properties, symptomata, as well as permanent ones. And we call them accidents in conformity with certain epiboli, which involve our conception of body as a whole, uh, and uh, also they happen to belong to a body. Accidents are perceived in the way in which sensation represents the idiotita, the idiotis, or the peculiar quality of each. And so accidents have their own epiboli, their distinctive modes of being projected on the mind through the criteria and be directly known by the mind. Towards the end of the letter to Herodotus, in an excerpt with clear ethical intent, Epicurus points back to the distinction between Catameros epiboli and Athroa epiboli and indicates how each of them contributes to the well being of students belonging to different groups. Please look at text six, which I won't read. I will just comment on it. Why near beginners? can attain tranquility by rehearsing in their mind the curiosity of the system and by recurring to them in particular circumstances, advanced Epicureans already gain tranquility or are close to achieving that goal. So the main benefit that they can draw from the epitome, from the letter, is to acquire a deeper understanding of nature as a whole. In other words, and Astroa epiboli of the universe and of its processes. This won't consist merely in the capacity of running over the cardinal tenets of Epicurus's physics, as beginners do, but is a major intellectual and spiritual attainment. Epicurus directs his followers to aim at that lofty goal by conducting a meticulous analysis, an Leon test, of specific aspects of atomism into the epiboli that they yield. These must be always catameros epiboli, which as we are now told, when we were not told of it at the beginning of the letter, but now we are ready to hear that these catameros epiboli have much greater significance for researchers than for beginners or for laymen seeking a shortcut to tranquility. A final passage from Epicurus bolsters further the interpretation of Catameros epiboli in terms of the direct manner in which the mind apprehends the contents of occurrent criterion acts. Namely, in Curie Doxa 24, he warns that if one absolutely rejects every single sensation without halting to discriminate between beliefs awaiting confirmation and, quote, what is already present in sensation or in feelings or generally in any representational epibole of the mind, then one will thereby be rejecting the criterion of truth altogether and will be thrown in confusion and error. Part two. I now wish to address the question whether the epibole of the mind entail projection or attention or both. As mentioned, the idea that epibole is mental projection stems, and naturally so, from the grammatical components of the word, from a P and Balin. But grammar cannot be our main guide here. Uh, rather, I suggest, we should consider the issue on theoretical grounds. If epibole is a mode of apprehension tied to the function of the criteria, how might it involve projection? 
I think the answer depends on the type of epibole that we are talking about. And I also think that there are several different and legitimate answers that can be given to that question. Regarding catameros epiboli, the idea of mental projection appears implicit through the metaphorical language that Epicurus, but also ourselves use for certain forms of apprehension and cognition. For instance, when we say that the mind grasps something, this evokes the image of the mind stretching forward in order to do so. Or when Epicurus says that, quote, we must continually walk over by this peon, the signposts of the system, and quote, uh, well, that too is suggesting an active movement towards something and somehow above it. Moreover, one might think of projection in connection to the mechanism by which the mind assesses the veridicality of an image. But there is another kind of answer as well, the alternative answer suggested by the two passages referring to Epicurus's conception of body, namely that the projection in question is not of the mind, but rather on the mind. The mind does not impose itself upon anything, but it is imposed upon by real properties and they are veridical representations. The fact of the matter, however, is that Epicurus's extant writings never talk about projection in any explicit way and never talk about, let alone, never analyze the idea of projection. And the question is why? I suggest the reason is that Epicurus's interest in epibole is mainly epistemological. Um, it's not psychological. And this is why, I think, where he's interested in the psychology of the thing, for instance, in the theory of perception or in the theory of thinking, he tells us a lot about how the films of atoms uh, leave the object, how they enter us, how we have representations. But about the Bibole, what he's mostly interested in is its epistemic function. And I think this is why he doesn't tell us anything more about what sort of projection is involved here. Let me now consider the related assumption that epibole is actually attention. The first thing I want to stress is that attention in modern philosophy and psychology is a ubiquitous notion whose content can vastly differ from one period to another and from one thinker to the next. The briefest glance at post-Cartesian approaches to attention shows that the latter cannot be the same thing as epibole, even though they do share common characteristics. Allow me a few remarks on that score. Not unlike Epicurus, Descartes and the philosophers coming soon after him wrote attention together with apprehension and memory. And they study the role of attention in respect of both the reception of input from the outside and the mental focus of that, on that input. Some philosophers attempt to develop substantive theories for attentive phenomena, whereas others, such as Locke and Bradley, view attention as a mode, not so much a matter of which processes are occurring, but rather how they are occurring. From the 18th century onwards, the tendency appears to be to expand the scope of attention and treat it as a crucial factor in perception, action, and reflective thinking. Even though the conceptions of attention at play may have a focal meaning, perceptual attention is evidently not the same thing as mental attention, and equally evidently, an active attention differs from both. Some notions of attention entail full consciousness. Others allow for dim awareness of attentive events, yet others for mere psychological reflexes. In short, there isn't a single uniform conception of attention that could legitimately be used to fix the meaning of a pibole. Those who wish to argue otherwise must first determine, I suggest, their own understanding of what attention really amounts to. Let me be clear, I don't deny 
that there are family resemblances between modern approaches to attention. And what little we have discovered about Epibole, but in so far as both bear on the selection and filtering of sensory input, the contribution of focusing to cognition and its impact on action, we may safely contend, I think, that the moderns and the pictures assign to attention and epiboli respectively substantive epistemic functions and go far beyond the mere requirement of alertness. What I do deny, however, is that these two notions are coextensive and can substitute each other in all relevant contexts. In addition to the problem of ambiguity, we have epiboli even when we dream, but we can hardly talk about attention in such cases. Epiboli are typically veridical, even in dreams, but attention does not always guarantee the grasp of truth. What's more, Epicurus himself treats the two notions as distinct when he urges, quote, that we must attend therein our present epiboli and, quote, in order to use them as a basis of sign inferences. The act of attending to our epiboli is distinct from the epiboli themselves. Finally, no modern notion of attention, so far as I can tell, can capture a thrower epibole. In the next and last section, I hope to show that the latter requires total focus, but also very much else. Part three. The first generation of Epicurean scholars appears to treat Epicurus's distinction between Athroa epibole and Catameros epibole as part of the canon. In Epicurean texts that some attribute to Polystratus, the third scholar of the garden, uses it almost verbatim for portraitive purposes. The author's point regarding Epibole is legible, even though the papyrus is very uh, damaged. Whether we make use of Catameros Epibole, which is specific and ephemeral, or Athroa Epibole, we should be moved to sing hymns to our savior, Epicurus. This remark stresses the relevance of Epibole to action, but also it is the first known Epicurean passage to explicitly associate Epibole with the idea of salvation. This connection becomes, however, very prominent in Lucretius. In the proem of the first book of the Rerum Natura, Lucretius hails Epicurus as the first man whose extraordinary mental powers enabled him to discover the laws of nature, defeat superstition, and liberate us from its fall. Look, please, at text seven. I am reading the second part. The energetic power of his mind, vivida vis animi, prevailed and issued forth, previcit et processit, far beyond the flaming walls of the world, as he roamed through the immeasurable universe with his mind and imagination. Whence he returned victorious to relate to us what can occur and what cannot, and how each thing has its power delimited and its deep set boundary stone. As a result, religion is now in her turn trampled underfoot, while we, by his victory, are raised to the height of the heavens." End quote. Here, Lucretius refers anonymously, but unmistakably, to Epicurus, to underscore the immense originality and importance of his achievement. This consists in a momentous mental act in which Epicurus's mind projected itself, said Procasis, beyond the world and roamed through, per agavit, the infinity of the universe with the result of apprehending all at once the true nature of things. This feat was not a matter of mere intelligence, but of Epicurus's intense and holistic engagement, mente animoque, Epicurus had to mobilize desire as well as reason 
intellectual energy, vivida vis animi, and courage, acrem animi virtutem, as well as the powers of contemplation and thought. The metaphorical phrases of the mind issuing forth, roaming through, are suggestive respectively of mental projection and comprehensiveness, while the image of the mind pushing open the gates of nature and shooting through them evokes the idea of absolute concentration. In brief, a perfect instance of a thrower at the The layers, the Epicurean spokesman in Cicero's composition on the nature of the gods, takes a similar approach. In defending the Epicurean view of nature and the gods against Stoic creationism, he maintains that the Stoic fail to grasp the truth about this matter because they lack the mental vision attained by Epicurus and available to his followers. A Epiboli is absolutely essential to that vision. And you can see this at text eight, which I also won't read. In text eight, Veleus suggests that the mind comprehensively grasps in such travels spatial infinity and the atomic constitution of the whole. And then one realizes that no divine artificer is needed to construct the world. No grand design has been drawn. No fate determines the world's processes. While Lucretius highlights the supreme importance of Atroa epibole, he rarely identifies cases of Catameros epibolae. A very rare example of that kind occurs in the, the Natura Realm uh, 2 in an argument to the effect that atoms are colorless. And uh, uh, the first one, to my knowledge, to have discussed this argument in, in some detail is David Sedley. So what I have to say is very much aligned with his own interpretation, actually. Um, Lucretius refutes then the counter argument of the Epicurean thesis that atoms are colorless by granting that if we couldn't conceive of colorless atoms, even by animi in ectus, we would do well to remove them from our ontology. But the argument goes, it is not the case that colorless atoms are inconceivable. In fact, we can conceive them by mental projection. Taking into account that people born blind must conceive a body as colorless and projecting that idea onto our own experience of perceiving body in darkness, we can in fact form a conception of colorless body. Lucretius treats injectus animi as the ultimate arbiter of conceivability here and as the means of judging whether the claim that atoms are colorless is true or false. Like Epicurus, he implicitly acknowledges that in the Ectus Animi has criterial powers. What he adds is that the latter tests conceivability as well as truth. And finally, let us turn to Philodemus. Lucretius is a close contemporary and an important Epicurean of the first century. His main contributions comprise, first, that he explicitly upgrades mental epiboli to the rank of the criteria of truth, and in the second place, that he uses Epicurus's twofold distinction on epiboli in new contexts and for new purposes. The evidence on the epistemological status of epiboli comes from badly damaged papyri and is highly conjectural. Nonetheless, one of the surviving fragments of the treatise on signs appears to attest that, quote, the representational epiboli of the mind are grouped together with sensations, preconceptions, and feelings as criteria. The relevant passage is text nine in your handout, and I am reading the second bit of it. Inferences from signs should be constructed if they are verified by observation and don't conflict with all the things that are called criteria of non-evident things, sensations, preconceptions, 
representational epiboli of mind and feelings, end quote. Assuming that the supplementation of this passage is approximately correct, Philodemus first relays a view that I believe was bequeathed to him by his teacher and Cicero's teacher, Zeno of Sidon of the School of Athens. And then he, the view is that inferences from signs about non-evident things have adequate epistemic warrant if they are verified by empirical evidence and not falsified by it. Then he refers to the three standard Epicurean criteria, and he adds the fourth, fantastikai epibolai lesbianoias. If we were wondering who were the Epicureans that according to Diogenes Lurtius counted the latter among the criteria of truth, well, here we have an answer. Philodemus and before him, Zeno of Sidon and his school. Perhaps there were others as well, but these ones at least were certainly parts of that group, uh, members of that group. Elsewhere in the same treatise on science that is, Philodemus follows closely the canonical doctrine when he refers to things that can become self-evident through representational epiboly of the mind itself. Given the overarching purpose of on science, Philodemus is probably inviting his readers to consider the epistemic relation between epibole and energeia, as well as their value for scientific investigation. So much then for the epistemic function of epibole in Philodemus. And to end, we should look at a, a case of Athroa epibole, which to my knowledge, is absolutely unique in the extant Epicurean writings. According to Philodemus, the act of epiboli in this case represents the pinnacle of an Epicurean's life and also determines its limits. The relevant passage occurs at the end of the treatise on death. This is text 10 in your handout, and I am reading a good part of it. Quote, and because of an attachment to life, they, that is foolish people, appear to push away even the epiboli focusing on death, tas epibolas, tas epauton. Then when the sight of death becomes clearly evident, it strikes them as something paradoxical. They are overtaken and surrounded and forced to bear a double misfortune. Sensible men, that is Epicurean men, on the other hand, even if for some compelling reason, they didn't suspect that the paragraph and limit of their life was already approaching when it comes into actual view after they have surveyed in their thought systematically and with the greatest clarity in a way that cannot be explained to the ignorant they are perfect enjoyment of everything and the utter unconsciousness that will come over them, they expire as calmly as they, as if they never had lost their epiboli, even for an instant." End quote. In the final lines of the magnificent peroration of on death, Philodemus completes the contrast between, on the one hand, older people irrationally clinging to life and ignoring the reality of death, and on the other, an Epicurean who understands the necessity of death and has trained himself to accept it. Both types of epibole are at play in this context. While fools are perpetually pushing aside their epibole of specific aspects of death, the catameros epibole then, the Epicurean philosopher, or somebody that has lived according to the principles of Epicureanism, attends to them and regularly contemplates with a mind's eye truthful images of human mortality. And therefore, he recognizes the advent of death and, unlike the fool, can face it with perfect composure. His final act, as Epicurus would put it, is a unique and perfect instantiation of Athroa epiboli, an act 
that engages all of one's mental and psychological resources, involves and involves projection as well as total focus. The Epicurean thrusts his mind backward towards the past as well as forward towards the future and contemplates in a tiny fraction of time and all of it at once, the wonderful life that he has lived and the nothingness that is to follow. He affects this mental journey systematically, rapidly and synop synoptically in a way impossible for those who have not received proper Epicurean training. And when that mental journey ends, he puts a paragraphos, a full stop to the narrative of his life and departs content. To conclude, I would like to very briefly summarize the main claims of my argument. Epibolis still remains an elusive notion, but I hope that some progress has been made in this paper regarding our understanding of it. The letter to Herodotus introduces a key distinction that has largely remained unnoticed hitherto in the literature, uh, but nonetheless, we find it to be canonical. It has been endorsed implicitly or explicitly by every main member of the Epicurean school. It is the distinction between Athroa epiboli and Catamerus epiboli. These two conceptions of epiboli are interconnected so that the mind's grasp of individual contents facilitates the comprehension of the corresponding whole and vice versa. Moreover, Epicurus suggests that there is an extremely close tie between the criteria of sensation, preconception, and feeling and catamerous epiboli. In certain contexts, the latter could be considered a distinct movement by which the mind focuses on the contents presented through the criteria. Most contexts, however, suggest that epiboli is a mode of apprehension associated with actual applications of criteria of truth, or current criteria acts. Several passages in Epicurus could give rise to the idea that epiboli is an independent criterion, but we found that Epicurus never says as much in his surviving works. This is probably why epiboli became an object of debate within the school. Some Epicureans, like Philodemus, endowed it with full criterial powers. Others presumably didn't. The innovations of Lucretius and Philodemus, however, mainly have to do with the immense ethical importance that they ascribe to epiboli, and in particular, a throw at epiboli. Lucretius describes it in such terms, uh, describes in such terms Epicurus's mental journey and the salvation that it brought to mankind. Philodemus uses the notion in a new way to suggest that at the extremity of one's life, the trained Epicurean would be able to contemplate, even for a brief moment, his entire existence as well as the termination of that existence as an integral whole. In the course of the discussion, I have revisited two assumptions that prevail in the literature, namely the idea that epiboli is or involves projection and the identification of epiboli with attention. Without denying that there is some truth to these assumptions, I have argued that both proje projection and attention are ambiguous notions and cannot exactly capture epibole either jointly or severally. In particular, the vastly comprehensive overview of the universe attained by Epicurus is an extraordinary achievement that requires far more than attention in any plausible sense of that term. Such momentous acts engage one's whole being, strain the powers of the intellect and the imagination, and have a totally transformative influence on our cognitive and our moral life. Thank you.